What's going on, everyone? I'm Travis Brown with the Eagle alongside former Texas A&M guard Mark French. Mark, uh, what's going on, man? Hey, guys. Good afternoon. Happy Friday uh, to everyone. This will be fun. Yeah. It's been a while since we've talked, so some stuff has happened with A&M basketball, mostly wins. Uh, they're they're heading into their away trip at Missouri, coming off that uh, big home win against Arkansas. I, I think we figured it was right before maybe the, the first Auburn game that we last talked and broke stuff down. What stood out to you the most about the Aggies and this little run they've gone on to, to take hold of sole pos- position of second place in the SEC? Yeah, I just think it's the evolution of the team, right? And uh, everybody's just gotten better (laughs) as the season has gone on, which isn't, you know, that's not typical. And uh, that doesn't happen everywhere. And I think almost to a T, every player has gotten better. Now it's whoever's playing the best or scoring the most on that particular night. That's changing. But as a, a cumulative, I mean, it's been so impressive to just see each of these guys just, develop into their particular role and I think they really have a great uh you know scheme ingredients whatever you want to call it um for how to win right now and uh just their overall aggression level and uh the resilience I mean to be down what they were the other night I guess the you know a top 25 net ranking team um and to come back and I'm just really proud of them man you look at it they're 11 and 2 in conference 19 and 7 overall um, it's it's all trending in the right direction. Yeah, exactly. I know uh, someone that stood out to you is Dexter Dennis. What have you seen from him particularly that's uh, made such a big impact with the Aggies? Yeah. Well, first of all, his ability to rebound from his position at his size. Um, but also, I think what I've I've noticed, I used to think the team kind of took after boots in terms of personality. I think what I've come to realize as I've watched them more is that they really are taking after Dex, Dexter's uh, persona. And so when he's playing with that, you know, aggression, Buzz would call it outside dog mentality, um, it's really fun, man. Like they all kind of follow after him when he's flying all over the court or locking up or being aggressive, driving downhill. Um, that's been an interesting piece because he's not, you know, I wouldn't put him on weight or Uh, boots his level in terms of you know scoring punch on a night-to-night basis but in terms of uh, you know the team taking after his personality on a game-to-game basis I think that's been a huge development uh, for Buzz and um, yeah man everything just has kind of really culminated and come and everything's fallen into place and so uh, I'm really proud of Dexter and you know at the beginning of the year I thought he struggled a little bit and wasn't who he you know is as a player and so anytime that happens and uh, you know, you're going to doubt yourself some and just to see him work through that and now kind of come out on the other side as, you know, a quasi leader of this group. It's, it's just phenomenal. It's credit to the staff, it's credit to Dexter. And um, I'm just really excited about his prospects, not just this season, but even now he's probably turned himself into a potential Euro league player, um, whether that be in the actual Euro league or, you know, one of the many other leagues um, over there and held a shot, maybe even at a summer league invite now. So, um, we'll see where it goes, but really, really proud of him. I don't know him well, but just watching from afar, I'm, you know, just happy with his uh, evolution. Well, you know, it, it's such a stark contrast from, I know we talked a little bit after the, the loss to Boise State, and one of the things that you mentioned about that game is you just didn't like the uh, the, the body language, the, the, the kind of air that the team had about them. Well, what a difference it is now uh, between that team that lost to Boise State and uh, this team that's running through SEC play. Man, if you'd have told me that they'd be 11 and two in conference after that Wofford loss, I'd have, I'd have looked at you like you're crazy, right? And so um, it's amazing what some coaching, some buy-in, and honestly, just sometimes it's just you have to go through those struggles together in order to, you know, kind of form form that bond that's going to carry you on into conference. And so they took their lumps early, but now they're reaping the rewards and. Um, I'm just really happy for the guys. I mean, this is the best start in in, in uh, program history since we've been in the SEC. Um, I don't know if there's you know five or ten other teams that are better at this particular moment. Um, now they got to keep working and building, but my goodness, are these next couple games going to be huge, huge games? Uh, just 
perception wise, but uh, seating wise now is something we can talk about. Um, and also just for Reed Arena and the fan base. Um, you look at Tennessee and Alabama, both coming to Reed Arena. Uh, the crowd's been a lot better recently. The students have been absolutely showing out. And so I'm just excited as an, as an alum and a, and a, uh, and a basketball alum uh, too. It just, it makes me happy because uh, that's how it should be. That's how college basketball is all about. And so uh, I'm just really happy for the guys. Of course, a guy who stood out to me and I think stood out to a lot of people, Anderson Garcia, kind of the default six man yeah. of the team of Ford's coming in. He's led in rebounds a couple of uh, uh, games so far down this little stretch run. If you pull up kind of his deeper stats, Tima has a, a plus 22 net rating when he's on the court uh, and a, a defensive rating of 90, which is in the 98th and 99th percentile of the country. Uh, when you look at some of those uh, uh, some of those rankings and and then. Uh, 37.3% offensive rebounding percentage when he's on the court, the team has that. What what have you seen from him? I know he's a guy, a lot at first that they're like, a lot of fans, a lot of people are like, what, what is he doing on the court? But I think his his impact has been has been really felt the last handful of games, if not a little bit more. Yeah, Travis, I think you're onto something there. Uh, I always say the, good, the, the sign of a good role player is that the stat sheet show, can show up in uh, other areas besides points. So, for instance, the other night he had two points, but what else did he do? He had 10 rebounds, four of which were offensive. He had a block, a turnover, and then he had five personal fouls, which means he's being active, right? And uh, anyways, I, I'm just really uh, surprised at his evolution and contribution. If I'm just – if I were to be completely transparent, uh, Buzz saw something that a lot of us didn't see, and that whole staff did, and it's credit to them. It's credit to Garcia for sticking with it. Um, he's really become an integral part of solidifying that bench rotation and giving A&M a big to come off the bench now that, you know, Julius and Henry are starting together. And so um, the numbers speak for themselves. You listed off some awesome stats. But also beyond that, sometimes you can just eye test it. The defense looks great when he's out there. The intensity is rat ratcheted up. And I love the I love the uh, lineups where we have like uh, Garcia, Boots, Dexter, Marble, or Henry in at the same time. It just it seems like a hornet's nest when the other team's on offense. And it's just really hard to score. Um, and so, yeah, super proud of Andy. Um, I know the, the staff and the players love him. Uh, and uh, – it's just it's credit to that kid for, for keeping his head down and coming in as a transfer and, and, you know, continuing to get better and make a contribution. I think this is a good point to stop and, and look and talk about the, 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 the role that taking charges plays in this program. Andy, uh, of course, took a charge there late in that Arkansas game that kind of helped seal the deal a little bit. And I'm sure a lot of people who have followed the team since you've been there know about the socks and everything like that, but I would argue to say that taking charges is is maybe even more of an emphasis within Buzz's program than your average program. What, 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 how do you compare that? And what does that kind of look like in the locker room and on the practice court? Yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things that like, you can't just talk about it like pregame or even in practice or like in film, like it's something that you have to like, truly practice like it has to become ingrained as part of like your psychological I don't know how to say it like disposition like okay that guy's coming downhill I'm just going to step over and take the charge and that those habits are formed you know starting in the summer going through the fall and and each day in practice and I think what's cool is uh the staff puts a big emphasis on it and uh then you get to see it play out in the game so it's not just this faux you know, oh, they have a, a sock wall and you get your picture and you get to sign it uh, in the film room each time you take a charge. Like, yes, that's cool. But I think the coolest part is that it it works. <laughs> and so uh, it, it truly does. And those kids love it. And uh, it kind of becomes a competition. You know, you on the side of that sock wall, I don't know if people know this, but there's a ranking for each player and how many charges they've taken that year. And so it's kind of, they kind of make it a uh, competition. And I think that's a really healthy thing and a beneficial thing because in the game uh, you can tell those guys are looking to do it. And uh, that it hurts. Like, I'll, I'll be honest, I've 
I took a few of them in my day. It's not it's not fun, uh, but you've seen the way it can change a game because one, you get a foul on the other player. It's a turnover, and it it also just there's something about a charge that um, heightens your awareness on defense. The following possessions makes your offensive possessions crisper. It's, it's a sign that you're in control of your uh, of yourself and that your team has a grasp on what they're really trying to do on defense. And so um, it's, it's an awesome thing that this program has going. What, what's, what's the best pair of socks you got? Okay. So um, I'm sure a, a lot of people have seen the video, but when, uh, when Buzz put me on scholarship, he did it through the socks. Uh, I had taken a charge in the Ole Miss game. Uh, backtrack. Billy Kennedy put me on scholarship uh, my junior year. When Buzz came in, he actually took me off scholarship. Um, and I decided to stick it out my senior year instead of transferring or anything like that. And then eventually as I started and was playing, it was kind of an integral part of things. Uh, I knew it was, I was probably, get, I was, there was a chance, there was an opening. I knew it, it could be, could happen. And uh, the way he did it was after an Ole Miss game, we had filmed the next morning and uh, I had taken a charge in that game. Well, he had given me, uh, there was a box that he, they bring around, you can pick which socks you want. Well, this time there was only one pair of socks in there. And it was, uh, it was a picture of an astronaut on the moon. And uh, our theme that year as a team was to the moon. And uh, it was the year one theme, you know, Buzz is real quirky. And anyways, that was our theme. And so it was very symbolic uh, of that year. And, uh, you know, so anyways, I opened the socks take the socks out and they're like, is there a note under there? And uh, under that pair of socks, there was a note, you know, Mark French, you've been put on scholarship. Congratulations. You know, it was real nicely written and uh, meant a lot to me. And I still have it in my office at home, but uh, I'd say, you know, I, I think I took a couple that year, but that moment's hard to beat. Those socks, uh, those don't get worn. Those uh, kind of sit in the office. <laughs> those are awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Um, So, Looking forward, you know, really that Arkansas game started a stretch run. That's that's the hardest part of their schedule at all. It's it's all quad one games except for uh, Mississippi. It's, there's a lot of resume boosters in here. Uh, I know we talked a lot about early in the season having kind of heat checks of is this a tournament team? I think, as you said earlier, as it sits right now, this is definitely a tournament team. But as they move forward, what, what do you kind of see from this this last little stretch and um, what it could do for postseason uh, opportunities? Yeah, so we've won six out of our last seven, Travis. We have five games remaining. We're 11 and two in conference. 13 was kind of the magic number. I'd actually kind of like to revise that and make it 14 just to be just to be safe, um, which means we need to go three and two in this stretch. So. I mean, that may look like beating Missouri, Mississippi State, and Ole Miss and losing to uh, Tennessee and Alabama, who are two of the top three teams in the net rankings in the entire country. Um, there's no shame in that. But, you know, it also could – this could shake out a couple different ways. I, I would love to see the Ags be able to get Tennessee or Alabama, go one and one in that stretch, right? And then with Mississippi State, Ole Miss, and at, uh, in Missouri, those are all three road games. Um, Mississippi State's 44th in the net. Um, Missouri's 50. So what I'd like to do is maybe go two and one in those three and then split Tennessee-Bama. And that would give us a high, high-end caliber win plus uh, two more conference wins on top of that. That puts us at, what would that be? That would be one, two, three. be like 14 and four in conference. Um, and... 22 and nine overall that gets you in you're probably a seven eight seed um so yeah i mean it's it's huge uh but these aren't gimmies remember mississippi state and missouri are trying to play their self into the tournament just like we are and there are not, no slouches and those are road games um uh so we'll see we'll see uh the crowd needs to be awesome for these home games um they need to get missouri and then you need to go to and ideally, if you're, if I were to put this in layman's terms, Travis, win Saturday, then go two and two, mm -hmm. and, and you're in. Um, now, there's another side of me that says, "Hey, we're competing for an SEC title," mm -hmm. and who would have thought that after that <laughs> Wofford loss? And so I, I'm greedy. I'm uber, uber, uber competitive, and I'm looking at it going, 
man, how fun would that Saturday, March 4th game be if the SEC title was on the line and it was in Reed Arena? Holy cow. Uh, it'd be amazing. So uh, those are my thoughts on the next five. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is if they do keep winning, they, that, that last game will be for the title. And, and how, how nuts would that be? Especially with Alabama, everything they've done, the, the freshmen they have. Yep. No, Brandon Miller's unbelievable. I mean, he I see him as like a Paul George clone, if I were to give an NBA comparison. He's just phenomenal. <laughs> and they're they're crazy talented. The NATO, it's the way he's accumulated talent and then let the guys he lets his horses run. Sometimes it backfires on him, but even going back to his days at Buffalo, like how could you not love to play for that guy if you're a scorer and uh, you know, looking to really shoot the ball? And so uh but man, would that be so so fun Travis I uh I think that game's already sold out um and I think Tennessee's close so those really should be two sellouts um I hate what uh I hate uh that we didn't have more home games on the weekends this year but that's just kind of how the cookie crumbled but uh gosh man it'd be really exciting but but yeah go get the win at Missouri and then let's go two and two down the stretch that would be kind of my baseline what is one statistical category or player that you especially are going to have your eyes on in this stretch run that that'll measure success for the Aggies? So he's been kind of cold lately. Um, cold compared to what he was doing a little bit earlier in conference, but I think it's boots. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I say this all the time and I know people are tired of me. It sounds like I'm beating a dead horse, but you win in March and you win late in the season with guard play. I don't care what anyone says, go look at all the past, you know, elite eight, sweet 16 teams. They're all elite guard play. Um, and for me, it's boots um, because Wade, like Wade's streaky and he's hot, but we need that consistency of boots. You know, he had 12 the other night, but I'm talking in that 15 to 20 point range. If we can get that boots, the one a la maybe like Q towards the end of last year, right? That's the mm -hmm. common comparison. Can we get boot stories averaging 15 to 20 on this last little stretch? Um, it, I, I think that's the key. Um, the ball's in his hands so much. Um, you know, it's 4'11 from the field the other night. Um, I think it's really pivotal that, that he continues uh, to do what he was doing earlier in conference. And, you know, the 30-point game at Auburn on the road comes to mind. Um, I think if you want to make a run and you want to go try to win this conference, whether that be in the regular season in the tournament, or if you want to be a second weekend team in the NCAA tournament, um, it's going to come down to Boots Radford and Wade Taylor playing awesome. Um, that's just my opinion. Of course. And, you know, a lot of people always say defis uh, defis defensive efficiency is always a key indicator. A&M is 62nd in the nation in that. Uh, and if you look at the, since January, uh, 11th in the country at 92 uh, adjusted defensive efficiency. Uh, Bart Torvik has them. If you uh, filter his uh, analytics by the beginning of the year, he has AM as the fourth best team in the country behind Alabama, Tennessee, and St. Mary's. So, since, since what date? That was January, what? January 1, the beginning of the year. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, yeah, the defense has been spectacular in, in many games. You know, there's some games where teams aren't even getting to, like, 20 points at uh, at half. You know, I have some LSU friends and uh, grew up with, and that halftime score the other night was, like, 41 to 17. I joked with them. I said, is that next year's football score? <laughs> um, but, no, no, uh, the defense has been spectacular. I think you're, you're hit the nail on the head, Travis, in pointing that out, and uh, that's – to me, that's like a given, like with a buzz team down the stretch is they're going to play great, great defense and be flying all over the place. And you're not going to know if they're in man or zone or combination of both. And uh, anyways, it's kind of controlled chaos, but uh, there's a method to the madness. Yeah, you know, and I'll, we'll close with this because you mentioned that. And I know there's a lot of talk about Buzz Williams uh, and his defense. Um, not to, you know, we could do a whole nother podcast on the way that Buzz Williams runs his defense, but just the general tenets of what they're trying to do with that defense, because it's really funny having had conversations with Buzz and kind of know about it to hear commentators say, well, oh, well, they're in their traditional zone or they're in their man. And they'll, they'll call it both from game to game, but it's not really either. It's, it's pretty unique. Yeah. It's a hybrid. It's just a matchup zone. 
uh, that where they pass guys off. So it's like a matchup zone where you're switching one through five, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was there, it was predicated on forcing a corner three because they had run the analytics and figured out that in college basketball, that was the lowest percentage shot. Um, and so they built the whole defense around it. They had an assistant leave for TCU uh, a couple years ago, and then they kind of redid a couple of the tenants. So it's a, a twist on it from when I was there. Same principles hold true, though. It's a, it's a matchup zone where you're switching one through five and passing guys off. Um, it's really confusing if you're on offense. Um, it's really hard to go against because the driving lanes are never there. But also when you're throwing it around the perimeter, you don't get the shots like you would in a two, three. Um, so there's not really, a, excuse me, there's not really a soft spot uh, to attack um, unless it's like top of the key and you're just bombing away from three. So uh, they're definitely onto something. It's very unique. Um, it's hard to emulate because it's hard to even explain. Um, it just kind of takes on a life of its own and, uh, over the course of the season, the guys figure out, uh, for themselves, how it's going to evolve almost. And so, um, it's it's fun to watch. I love seeing the offense confused. It's, uh, it's kind of a thing of beauty. (laughs) There you go. Mark, thanks so much again for giving us a few minutes of your time to break some of this stuff down. And we will be checking back up with you as this regular season winds to a close. Thank you, Travis. Let's go win an SEC title. What do you say? I I think that would be a great atmosphere in that game. (laughs) Thanks so much, man. (laughs)